Um, I'd just like to welcome you all tonight to the Museum Resource and Learning Centre. Thank you very much for all coming out on a rather nasty night. I've been informed, not that I've been outside. Um, but anyway, welcome um, to a fantastic meeting that's going to be chaired by Jesse Morgan, who I'll hand you over to in a minute. I'd just like to, um, I'm here as the museum team leader, and I'm just here to really give you a bit of housekeeping. Um, the Resource Centre building, this is our main learning room. If the fire alarm goes off, you need to exit the way you came in, go down the stairs, out the front door, and then muster at the far end in the um, entrance way of the gate. Keep to one side in case the fire engines come charging through. So you're probably better off going into the bus depot site, the old bus depot site, if we need to muster. There's also a fire exit out the back here, um, which is just going through this door, down the, the metal stairs around the back of the building and follow around. Um, the loos, I'm sure some of you have already discovered, there's a couple up here. The one downstairs, which is larger, isn't functioning unfortunately, but there is um, another accessible loo which staff can help you towards if you need it. Um, I think that's all I need to say, and so I will just pass you straight over to um, Jesse Norman, our chair for the evening. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Judy, for that uh, and uh, important introduction. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming out on a miserable night uh, and braving the traffic in the centre of Hereford in order to get here. And the fact that you've done that, done that bears testimony to the importance of the issues in front of us. Um, now, we've got quite a packed schedule as I look across the um, uh, Mount Rushmore of uh, um, figures to my left and to my right. I want to give everyone a chance to speak. I also want lots of questions from the audience for obvious and good reasons. So what we'll do is take the um, proponents of the specific proposal before us, which is the creation of the new ranking center um, first, and then we'll open up for questions and then I'll bring in other people from the panel. And to kick off with, uh, can I invite uh, John Faulkner to tell us about the plans that he and uh, H. Lug um, uh, have developed. <laughs> and I hope you'll give them your lugs when he does. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Are you using slides, John? Are you using slides, John? Yes. Good. In that case, I will evacuate. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to shout. If you can't hear me at the back, will you wave a hand or something? Um, Hereford Library Users Group has been in existence for almost 20 years. Uh, and it always has been our aim to get a modern central library for the county. Uh, and to replace the outdated and not fit for purpose building in Broad Street, which is, was built in 1875. And so if we could improve it, we could get a better service uh, for a t up to 21st standards for the whole county. Okay. The, we've seen and we have looked at a large number of libraries around the country uh, and there's a few of them, uh, and we see all these, and it just leaves us green with envy. Um, and what, to what they can what they can provide, uh, and uh, it, as they say, it is quite remarkable what a modern library can do. And there's, of course, two other examples: uh, the Hive at Worcester, which is a super place, on the Forum at Norwich, both of which, <coughs> on opening, the library usage shot up. <coughs> So we are hoped we started off uh, by hoping we might get a new building on the planned civic quarter, uh, but that didn't happen, uh, and it came to nothing. So it left us to consider what else we should do, and could we rebuild or improve the present building. Uh, then along came in September the asbestos problem where uh, in altering the building to accommodate uh, WISH, uh, you've heard of WISH? Yeah. No, WISH is, if I remember, Wellbeing Information Signposting for Herefordshire. <laughs> but they were going to come on and use some space in the ground floor of the building, uh, and that's where they discovered the asbestos. The library was closed, but it did have the effect of the cabinet having to think what they should do next. And they uh, decided to reconsider uh, some of the proposals we put to them uh, a couple of years ago and invited us 
to uh, put forward proposals. That's the, and that finished up with the resolution uh, that they passed. And you can see what we have to do. We have to confirm by the end of February whether or not we wish to work with the council to explore options for the future of service delivery. And that's what this proposal is all about. <coughs> then, here is what we've done. We've produced this draft preliminary scheme, which we've called for the moment the Rankin Centre, primarily because Rankin was the benefactor who found a lot of the money for the original library building. We introduced and found a lot of innovatory ideas which could go into a new building. We've developed this concept of a community hub. We've talked to a lot of other library and museum groups, and we've discussed it with the professionals in the library service. <coughs> so all these interested parties have been involved, but it is still very much work in progress. And what we want from this meeting, we've, been, you know, we've talked to schools, we've talked to the, uh, the, the embryo university, we've talked to the cathedral, we've talked to the colleges. So this is not completely out of the blue, and a lot of people have been involved in its, in its birth, uh, and we've had a lot of support. <coughs> but what we want from this meeting is your view. Uh, is it, what do the public think about it? Um, and is it viable? Would it be something that Herefordshire could do with? And uh, do we proceed, or how do we proceed? Now, this uh, scheme um, for reconstructing Ford Street is one that's been developed by William McMorran, who is a member of the group and an architect, uh, and he'll tell you now how we can improve the building by reconstructing it. Yeah. Okay, thank you, John. Um, just by way of explanation, I, I, I would like to think of myself as local because I've lived in Herefordshire for 20 odd years, but I know that doesn't count for a lot of people. But, 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 but I'm passionate about what could happen in the centre of Hereford and what could be a wonderful focus for the whole community within the county. And it's <laughs> To my mind, uh, it's, it's staring us in the face. It is actually the Broad Street building. So without further ado, we'll, we'll, uh, I'll just explain what we have so you can orientate yourself and try and understand what everyone's trying to put together in our life. So if you look at this drawing, this is a section here, it is here, with Broad Street at the front and the lovely Victorian building with its little pitch roof and all that lovely architectural frontage design. And at the back, uh, these two large spaces of the art gallery and the museum and Albury, Albury Street at the back here. So what we have is a building which is about uh, 17 or 1800 square meters of space. But of course, a lot of it is very compromised. We've got a basement storage area, which I can't stand up in. And the Woolhope room, which is part of the reason for the whole thing being built in the first place, you can't get to if you are not able to easily get about. So it's a very compromised building, as everybody knows. And the internal space has no external app. Outlook at all, I, I mean, I nearly expire in there sometimes when I've been sitting doing some studying. It gets very, very hot. So it's a space which is quite large, but it could be used in a far better fashion. For example, that big foyer space there climbs right up here. It's a great space, but very difficult to use. On the other hand, it has this fantastically lovely Victorian frontage. How could we transform that? Because it's a free space in the middle of the county. We don't have to look for another one. We don't have to go out to the industrial estate or somewhere else where it's going to get expensive. It's right here. And I do have a lot of experience working with existing buildings and transforming them and trying to keep the price down. Because if this is going to happen, it's got to be a sensibly priced building. A lot of those other buildings, to name just a few, are very expensive and it blows the project out of the water at the beginning. So it's got to be a sensible proposal. How could we do it? Next slide, please. So what we should do is to keep all of the existing perimeter of the building. I know that those that know the site in detail will, will, will sort of wonder about how we're going to do that. But the principle would be to retain the existing envelope and not to get involved with a lot of destructive reconstruction and all the costs that involve with that. So we would keep all of these perimeter walls and we would keep all of the existing 
main frontage building for which it's listed. It's a listed building, it's a beautiful building, and that would be retained. But there is an opportunity, therefore, to insert within that a new structure. And so what could happen, instead of this very internalized building, it would be possible to reinsert one, two, three, four, at least five floors. The building right next door is five stories high. The precedent for height is already right there next door. So we could build an internal structure on the minimum number of columns, because, as we know, underneath the building is a major archaeological site. And we don't want to start digging all that up. So the minimum number of foundations, OK? And those foundations will rise and support all of these perimeter walls. So that, that's, this is a real possibility. And therefore, when you came into the building, and we could remove some of the, some of the metalwork which has been introduced in these uh, lovely arcades to the front of the building, so that you could see right into the building and move from the street, from Broad Street, easily into the purpose of the building, and as you start to arrive in what was the space where the old staircase rises, you would then have this vista up through the building, and off it would be all of the main spaces, and you would see them all. Um, the Wish Centre, a place for business, a place for children, a place for students, and for library users in general. It could really be a real hub for the community, and it could be built at a sensible price. I really do believe we could manage to do this. If we take the next slide. So this is a section through the building. These are the existing walls. And we would build columns up the middle here and a lovely staircase rising up to a bright western window, a bit like a, a cathedral, if you like. Um, a cathedral for the people, this would be, wouldn't it? Uh, next slide. And there's a little sketch of, 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 of how it might look on one of the levels with the bookcases all around, the central staircase. And you rise up through these voids and arrive on a top floor where perhaps the museum and uh, an art gallery would be. And there would be this multiplicity of uses within the one building, and it would all be available and there'd be free circulation through it. This is really possible. Next slide. These are some technical architectural drawings which you did, which demonstrate different views as you work your way through the building. Uh, and we've got drawings up on the wall for you to have a look at afterwards if you want to. So I know time is tight, so I'm going to shut up. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. We're moving on to, to John Hitchin now, um, also on behalf of uh, the users group. Um, patently, a lot of money is involved, and there is a, a hang-up about funding a library because under the Public Libraries Act, it's a, an understanding that the local government has to fund the library service. It's therefore very difficult to raise money elsewhere for a library as such. So. This explains why we seem to have gone off in, the <coughs> in a number of different directions. Um, we first of all realised that there was something special about this building, which is actually that there is a library and a museum cheek by jowl, at the moment completely separated, but why should they be? Um, we also s see that, that, and following what's happening elsewhere, that the, 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 the library and museum can be, play a much more important role in lifelong learning importance of being able to find things is important, approaches to the digital age, crucial. Um, and what we also thought, and I will explain this in a moment, is that there should be a focus on the uniqueness of Herefordshire. And then finally, it's a community hub, as you've probably already seen with various places like coffee shops, meeting areas and so forth. Um, the motto is only connect. There is this huge range of things um, that we have, that we the people of Herefordshire own, a um, hundred thousand objects in this building we're sitting in, any number of books, uh, archives, all sorts of things, all at the moment tend to be in different silos. Um, so what we've looked at is the idea of the synergy between these different things and the starting point was, uh, for me, was the inspiration I got by visiting Hampshire and looking at their discovery centres. Because uh, Yenon Ezra, one of the most innovative librarians in the country, started to introduce the idea of, of books, museums, artefacts, archives, cheek by jowl. Um, unfortunately, budget cuts then intervened and it stopped dead. Um, but there are things in this building and in the library and elsewhere that are so special and unique that one feels one wants to bring them forward and as it were, make them a showcase. Um, and it doesn't really matter whether it's books or, or pictures or maps 
or whatever, um, they can be actually put together in an imaginative form. Um, and so this, this synergy would um, consist of, of all sorts of things that are currently available in different places, but actually often quite difficult to access. Um, but there are, st there, there are beginnings now to see the sort of thing that's emerging, like, for example, the new Herefordshire History website, which is actually focusing on, on a, a range of, of, of sources of, of material. Um, and I was struck recently as a volunteer working on the map collection in the library, which is fantastic, but of course the bulk of it is completely unseen because it's kept in cabinets and is quite difficult to handle. It would be wonderful to see these old maps brought out and seen and uh, a perspective of Herefordshire. Um, one of the things particularly um, where there can be a real synergy is, is, is starting with young children. Uh, and this is a point where I can address an issue that we do have to address, is that the fallacy that somehow books are yesterday. Um, only two days ago, the Book Trade published a report to show that children's books are zooming ahead, and interestingly, the sector of children's books that's doing best of all are books for teenagers. Surprise, surprise, because teenagers are supposed to stop reading. But they're doing amazingly well. And it's it, no accident in my mind that one of the best sellers at Christmas was, was a wonderful picture book um, uh, which sold in hundreds of thousands. Um, and these pictures are really show some of the innovations that are taking place elsewhere, including, by the way, in the hive. Um, and Ross itself, Ross Library, has thrown itself into this by uh, commissioning a, a library mural painted by children. Um, uh, incidentally, I once had a bookshop where the whole staircase was p painted by a, a mural on a design by Jan Pinkowski, and it was it was produced by two classes of school children, and it was a dragon that went all the way up the stairs, and the children could follow mm -hmm. it from one mm -hmm. level to another. That's the kind of creative thinking that ought to go into a, 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 a library for children. Um, and then lifelong learning. Well, <laughs> that's what it looked like once. Um, um, it's now beginning to look really amazing, the pictures across the, 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 the middle of, the, of this frame. Um, these are pictures of, of, of recently developed uh, academic libraries, uh, very enterprising, very interesting, um, and even as we speak, there's a new one opening, for example, in Nottingham, which is really high-tech in the digital age. Um, and then, um, at the bottom, they just show that it's, it's, it's important in our mind that, that it's quite conceivable that one part of this building could be for um, the university uh, library. The interchange between the students using the university library and other forms of higher education would be seamless, but the facility would be there. Um, discoverability is a terrible term, but it is actually one that's being banded about by publishers uh, great to the moment because they're struck with the fact that there are really serious problems about people discovering what they're publishing. 120,000 new books were published last year. There's a backlist in print of about one and a half million books. There's goodness knows how many millions of books that are out of print but which people are still seeking in second-hand bookshops or wherever. So there's an amazing resource but it's huge and finding a way through this is I think something that booksellers, publishers, libraries have all got to think much more about. And I think interestingly here, it, we've got technology coming our way. Uh, of the pictures on here, on the bottom left, is Manchester City Library where the, the archives are accessed in an entirely new way, uh, with a sort of stand-up screens that they, they touch and, and work their way through. And on the right, uh, Welsh are using iPads to check out books and find out what's where and whatever. Lots of scope there. Now, I can't pretend that we can unroll a package saying, look, this is what you should have, because some of it's still got to be invented. But at least the possibilities are there to go in this particular direction. It's innovation. Um, the digital age, of course, is amongst us. Um, rather unfortunately, three of these pictures <laughs> are, uh, originate with Google, um, uh, who... Um, have recently cooperated with Manchester City Library to state, open something called the, Mac, the, 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 the Google Garage, up the top left-hand corner and the two bottom screens, um, 
And that's an that's a, a interaction area for, for people, particularly young people, but anybody of any age, to come in and get themselves guided through the complexities of the internet world. Um, and technology there, of course, is racing ahead. Um, and one of the things we certainly want to think about doing for this place is actually make sure that in the, perhaps in the part of the faster show pr uh, program, that the, the ranking centre is a place where you can get super fast broadband access because that's what young people want. Um, now, uh, the other day, um, uh, the other day, a little while ago, I bought a copy of the book on the left hand side, mm. The Archaeology mm. of Herefordshire. Mm. It's an amazing book. Uh, I can't remember, and I've been a, in the book trade all my life, I can't remember a, quite such an extraordinary piece of local mm. publishing. First of all, because it, it's a superb job by Loggerston Press who published it, but Keith Ray has done an absolutely magnificent job. But for me, the real lesson was that if you go through it, um, and I learned so much, I was, uh, I was uh, quite embarrassed at how little I'd known before, how many of the illustrations are of things which are actually in this building. Um, all kinds of things, from all sorts of ages, and they do need to see the light of day. And so one of the things that we want to do is to actually bring these out. Now, I put the quote at the top, you probably can't read it, um, from the moment that we just descended one of the county's boundaries, <coughs> hills, into the lowlands, we were conscious that we had entered a world somehow apart. I don't know how many of you have experienced this, but every time I drive from Worcester to Hereford, and yeah. there's that point where you go over the top and you see the whole panorama of Herefordshire in front of you. <coughs> it's old churches, it's wonderful field patterns, it's orchards, and the black mountains in the distance. Um, one is reminded what an extraordinary account of this, and I speak as a Londoner, and I think that one of the things that, that this um, adventure of ours ought to focus on is the uniqueness. We've after all got one of the oldest libraries in the country, um, the, the, the Cathedral Chain Library, um, and we've just seen republication of the buildings of England. Um, I actually worked for the, the, the company that originally published it, and it was a tiny volume. Um, uh, written entirely by Nicholas Pevin himself. The new volume, several authors, but the list of acknowledgement is extraordinary. And that applies as well to um, the, uh, the Keith Ray book. If you look through the acknowledgements, mm -hmm. it's like a kind of panorama of, of experts, several of whom incidentally are sitting in this room. Um, and uh, one of the things that strikes me is that there's this extraordinary body of know-how that we've got somehow to actually see expressed through the ranking centre. And I've, I've illustrated the, the, the latest World Hub transactions, um, which I get and re read avidly. It, it, it's, it's got, I dare I say, a slightly boring cover, but it's been that way for a long time. <laughs> the contents, let me tell you, are wonderful. And uh, there's, a, there's a splendid uh, uh, piece in, the, in, in this issue by one of our members, John Eisel, um, who looked at the Jordan boatyard and, and explored that. Interestingly, in his acknowledgments, he acknowledged the work done by two of the librarians in Hereford who helped him track down his sources. And then the illustration on the right, um, by Red Fulton, um, is of Kilpeck. Um, uh, Reg was a near neighbour of mine until he died. Uh, a wonderful old man, uh, uh, worked at the Arts College for most of his life. Uh, wonderful engraver. And his drawings <coughs> of Kilpeck, I think, illustrate again this extraordinary quality that Herefordshire has. It is one of the most magnificent churches in the world. Not in this county, not in England, in the world, because it is quite unique. Uh, and we have our own school of sculpture, of course, the Herefordshire School of Sculpture. Um, now, this may sound tangential to, uh, to, to the Rankin Centre. To, to my mind, it's absolutely central to it. Uh, it is about making all these things available to a population but in addition, uh, the Rankin Centre becomes a hub, a community hub, <coughs> and people are a bit sniffy about this, oh, well, you're, you're selling off space for commercial whatever. Um, it has to be done. Um, they have to, in order to generate the income to keep this operation going and to make it work the way it does, it has got to raise money, and the uh, 
the, the obvious ways like the um, the retailing of the at Brighton or the cafe at Gosport and a lot I mean cafes are in most modern libraries now uh, are very useful money spinners are quite apart from which research has shown that actually people who use libraries quite like them um, and the Rankin Centre therefore will be a, a, if you can read this now, <laughs> a, a kind of hub uh, radiating out to the branch libraries sucking in information from the digital world, from Hark, from the, uh, this place here, um, and acting as a kind of a, a, an interchange, if you like, uh, uh, for all this, this uh, wonderful uh, material that can be shipped about from place to place. Now, John, it's your turn. <laughs> Don't worry, there's not much more. <laughs> um, so what next? And the first question, obviously, <coughs> is money. Uh, and uh, then here you see some of the things that have obviously got to be done. You have to finance the project studies, the initial studies. That's money which is probably fairly easily obtainable. You've then got to find the money to continue the project on, the capital costs of the changes. You've got to develop the revenue screen, as John has just said. Uh, there are all sorts of things which we think could be developed there um, and which would, which would um, help to produce uh, some greater revenue um, for, for the building. Catering, we talked about, increase the stock which Batney needs doing, staffing has to be looked at, the building can be designed environmentally more than that to save money as well. Uh, and you then have to cover the maintenance costs. So there are a number of questions here which have to be answered on money. Then we also have to do establish a project team um, and that uh, needs to be a team which is well read, well led and enthusiastic uh, and with experience and the skills that are necessary. Uh, and this team would have to cooperate with and we would hope cooperate with a fully supported council. And if any of you feel you'd like to join this team or could be a, give us advice or help, please let us know. Come and talk to us. Come and tell us. We've got to find the necessary funds for the next six to nine months, uh, and that could well come from somewhere like Heritage Lottery Fund. Uh, we have to develop this design, as we said, and investigate all these sources of funds. The revenue question is... Uh, difficult. We can't, like Norwich, we cannot build a car park on top of the building which will produce a large amount of income, which is the, the saving grace of Norwich. And uh, we would need a temporary library, a better temporary library than the one we've got at the moment, and we'd have to find somewhere for that. Can it be in some empty shop? First floor of Maylord is empty, Chad's is empty, or do you put some huts on a car park somewhere? And that's got to be found. <coughs> so these are all things that have to be done, and there's an awful lot of work to do. So it's a challenge, a big challenge. And it will be the community uh, that takes this, this has to decide whether they should go forward. You're going to have a lot of influence in this. And we would produce, we think we could produce at the end of it, a, a building which is quite iconic. It would be unique in the country. It would bring people into Hereford. And it would be a great benefit to the economy of the whole county. Now, in introducing this proposal, we haven't forgotten there are a lot of libraries around the county, uh, all in the market towns and the villages, some of them being very effectively run by volunteers. But you can't use volunteers for everything. But they have come together and they are supporting this proposal. And they've also come together and formed a group called Joint Action for Hereford Libraries. 